Welcome to Road to Blake Street Banter, where one of us knows what the word banter means. The other two are long for the ride. And I think, Tyler, I think we can add one of you two to know what the actual word banter means, because you guys did work last week without me. So, yeah, we, we bantered all right. We bantered all right. <laughs> It was a solid pod. I got like the stomach bug, like literally an hour before we were supposed to go live. I was like, y'all, I can't do it. And so, you guys held it down, Mike doing his thing. And it was a nice little pod there. So, the whole teamwork, dream work thing is happening. And I don't know, the intro might have to change. But people know what the word banter means. And that's a little scary. <laughs> what up, Cade? When, where are you? What are you doing? I don't know if you can tell us or whatever. I, we miss you on the field. So, you can let us know. That'd be sweet. But uh, we are live here to recap week three, week three of the major minor league season, which is insane. A lot of takeaways, <laughs> a lot of things to banter about, which is a good thing, right? So it'll be sweet. What up, Chris? Thanks for hanging out. Um, a lot to talk about, a lot to talk about. And I want to start with Luis Amarosa. This is a player spotlight. There's a nice little sp- little piece on him by Isaac Stevens on our blakestreetbanter.com website. Yes, this is a shameless plug, but it's also a way just to introduce you to more players. So basically, Luis Amorosa throws heat and has spin. I don't, maybe Tyler can give some of his little things here, but he's with the high A Spokane. Um, he's out of Venezuela. He's what, 24 years old now. He's been with the Rockies for about six, seven years. Just Big strikeout number is a little erratic with his pitches, but the spin rate is 2,400 on all of his stuff. And he's getting some horizontal break. Change up in slider move in opposite directions, which is always nice. But his sinker is averaging 66 or 96 miles per hour. 66 would be terrible. <laughs> and possibly uh, triple digits here and there. Like we talk about some of these big arms happening, like when we got Dollander and Halverson and Chuck just scored. We were tied. Let's go. And here we are with Luis Amorosa, like doing his thing. So huge shout out to Isaac for kind of introducing the Rockies masses. You won't see that anywhere else. Yes. Another shameless bug. Um, but can you add anything to that, Tyler? I mean, me, me and Isaac behind the scenes have been, he's been like, why isn't this guy just killing the game? That was his question. Can you, is there anything you see as to why this dude is not just dominating? Because you do look at his stuff, and he's he's a mid nineties right hander with a with a really solid changeup and and a solid slider. It seems like a guy who should be absolutely dominating. This could be the year he puts it all together. Um, you know the 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 book is kind of still out there as to why this guy is not up there with Angel Chavi and Juan Mejia. Like so, seems similar. So we have to keep an eye on that. Yeah, I have. I can't say I've been able to watch him pitch, and I do not remember watching him in Fresno. So it'll be another name to look out for. Cade, I feel you, dog. That's, that was me last <laughs> week. So the flu, <laughs> the flu has gotten Cade down um, at the facility. But huge shout out, dude! Like top thirty Rocky system. Let's go. Yeah. That got you got moved up there. So huge shout out to that. Uh, should feel better around mid May. That flu bug is, is getting you. <laughs> when it's over, are you starting or are you relieving? I don't know if you can give us that either. We we've been we've been wondering what you decided on that since the last time we talked. Uh, but hopefully feel better soon. And I can't wait to see you in mid May, wherever that might be. But top thirty Kate Denton in the chat. Again, you don't get that anywhere else. Let's go, boys. Let's have some fun. All right, let's hit up the isotopes. They won games. <laughs> they went three and three. They split the series. They tied their season record. And uh, it's just good to go. All right. Kay Denton, you heard it here first, will be a reliever with the Rocky system. I don't know. Just, let's just add more hardware to that, that shelf, big dog. All right. Um, Hunter Goodman had home runs in four straight games. Almost had five. Uh, didn't, didn't quite get it. Aaron Schunk had a big series. Uh, just there were some good takeaways to get take away from Albuquerque. Finally, what were some things that took stood out to you, Mike? That uh, was like, yeah, that was cool. Yeah, me, me and Tyler talked about this series last time, and we were kind of worried because home series did not go well, and they're coming here to El Paso, 
And El Paso has some dudes on that team, and they came out three and three. We have so we showed a lot of power in this series. Craig Jones went yard a couple of times. Hunter Goodman had I think five and four games, like just outrageous numbers. Even for the PCL, that's outrageous. Uh, we even had some pitching performances that I was. I mean, we looked last week. If that's what we're comparing it to, like, of course we're gonna have better pitching performances. Last week is probably one of the worst weeks of isotope pitching we've ever seen, and that's just the PCL for you. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think we say that every every week. That's the PCL doing PCL things. It's just a trip. Uh, yeah, but Duga Darnell got in. I saw he he had a nice little shutout two innings there. So that's good to see after his his bump up there. Um, anything that's kind of stood out to you, Tyler? I mean, Riley Pyant continues to he's he's starting to really find his footing. This past week, he had th- he pitched three and a third innings over over three games, struck out five. Walk just one, and I mean that's the biggest figure there is that he walked one guy, uh, but also Greg Jones is just stealing bags. Yeah. That dude is is fast. We saw the the Topes post a video the other day of him making a running catch in center field. That dude's making an impact with his legs. I want to see a little bit more with the bat, but he's doing he's doing the things that will always shine through with him. Right, that speed, like you can't teach that speed. That catch that he made in left center, like absolutely insane. Like the stat cast on that would be that would be fun. Sam Hilliard had a home run robbing catch, also. Like it was just a lot of just athletic dudes playing out there. It's it's fun. Like Greg Jones might be the most fun guy to he's electric. Like you almost can't like turn away. Like he's on base, he's going to beat out a gra- traditional like ground it into a double play thing and beat it out. Like the speed that he has, like, I don't know if we kind of, I don't know if we knew that was that fast coming into the season. No, he's perfect for like a small ball. You need one, one run. He gets on base, steals second, steal third. I mean, that's happened like every single game. I feel like where he's stealing around basically. And it's, he's stealing runs from these teams. And you think that might be what the Rockies kind of need? Like you're like, remember when Winston Bernard got called up a few years ago? Like that was sweet, right? Like the story itself is awesome, but like he brought that extra element that was just missing for the Rockies and they won a few games. They were playing close. Like it was just a vibe changer, so to speak, because he could have impact the game with his feet in so many different ways. I feel like a Greg Jones on the bench would be kind of nice in that sense. Like no, if against no, offense against jake cave like he's doing well in his role and doing his thing but like a greg jane jones in that role i don't know tyler i just think it sounds really cool i mean we saw jake cave play some center field in that double header and i feel like that that seems like a the sky is falling type of situation where he he didn't play center field last year and now he's coming to course field and playing center field i don't think that's really part of the expectation with jake cave greg jones can pick it out there so you know there there's value in that that you can get some center field defense when Bretton Doyle's not in the lineup because that dude can't play every day he's he's running like a madman out out there (laughs) he's got stuff going on like he needs a day off and Greg Jones would be an ideal fill-in and then yeah as you mentioned with Wynton Bernard like Greg Jones could also be that catalyst on the base pads the guy who's able to really take that extra confidence the Rockies need excitement right now. It's it's been a little bit dry on that offensive side. They could use a little bit of explosiveness, and Greg Jones is explosive if nothing else. Right. Yeah, I know circumstances weren't like really there, but we just saw Kyle Freeland pinch run. Like <laughs> Greg Jones, that's we win that game if we have Greg Jones in that spot. You're not wrong. You're not wrong. I wonder. I wonder if Chris Beck has an idea of somebody else that could be fun and exciting <laughs> that could be up in triple. I don't know though. I mean, Jordan Beck on fire, right? To start the season, this week he was human, which is, it's which is fine, right? Still had a home run. Still had seven RBIs, three walks, three strikeouts. Like again, PCL number is whatever that is, but. 676 OPS. And so 25 at bats, he's had those five hits, right? So I think this is like, I would love to see Jordan Beck. I think he would be, he would be absolutely fantastic to have up there. But I think rushing guys up is super scary. Like we, I remember seeing it with the Detroit Tigers. Spencer Torkelson, 
you're on up. And he struggled mightily. And then you have to play the, all right, how does this guy, how does this guy react to sitting on the bench because he's not playing well? How does he react to being sent back down because he's not playing well? Like Jordan Beck, he's a baller, right? Like he, he, he's going to want to play. And like that frustration and like, where should you be learning in the triple A? Should you be learning in the major league? What's Bud Black leash with that? Because I think we all kind of know what that would look like. So like, there's this weird yo-yo kind of thing, like where you like, you want these guys up there and to be exciting and change it. But like, at what point do you kind of need to figure out what they're struggling with? Right? Like Jordan Beck, they, they found the holes in his swing this week. Right. So like, what is he going to take back? What's he going to learn from that? And I don't know, Tyler, like for me, it's like, how, where, when is that fine line? Like Jordan Beck is a future major leader, right? And he's going to be a solid player no matter what. But like, how soon do we start that clock is always so much fun, but also so worrisome. Yeah, I mean, first things first, happy birthday, Jordan. Turned 23 on the 19th. That was Friday. So I hope, hope he had a fun Friday, uh, you know, with the Topes. But we we were having discussions in our in our group chat about this this 40-man roster situation. We got to see Ty Block get called up the 40-man because of Daniel Bard. It, it's just tough. The, the Rockies don't want to get rid of anybody, and that that's going to slow things down. Uh, unfortunately it's going to slow things down. It's going to bring us back to reality because for Jordan Beck, a, a down week with a 676 OPS, like if that's your down week, right? That's not bad at all. Um, I, I, at this point he's ready, like tentatively he's ready. Like he could, he could go make an impact at the big league level, but are there still some refinements that he could make? Yeah. And that's where this, maybe this 40 man dilemma is a, is a blessing in disguise that he can take a little bit more time and and really you know find his groove down there before getting he's going to get a cup of coffee this year at the least so maybe he really gets in tune for that opportunity um but he's he's basically ready yeah there's yeah the, i i have thousand percent agree you. oh. you're good I, go i thousand thousand percent agree like he's definitely ready but if you look at what the angels are doing with nolan shan I'm not lagging. What the Angels are doing with Nolan, Nolan Shanuel right now, it's complete. It's just not okay. Like, he's not ready for the MLB level. He's going to be a great MLB player. Not okay. He's batting, like, .05 right now. I think you put Jordan Beck up there. I just want to see – get get his feet wet. See what he does. He he might have a magical moment. He's probably, probably going to strike out a lot. It's the, your first time in the MLB. It's going to happen. But I think we all just want to see him in a uniform, see him play, just see him – even if he gets sent back down. This, this kind of reminds me of Nolan Jones last year where it's just like – not if he gets called up, just when. Like it could be any day now. <laughs> and, and get called up for a weekend and then go back down. But <laughs> that's a that's a different thing. Uh the thing with me, like we all we always talk about the walk rates and strikeout rates, right? Like what's that fine line? Jordan Beck is striking out at 19% in his first real triple A experience in the first 19, 20 games, which is insane. His walk clip is at 12%. So like, is there needs to be a little bit more time for that to kind of figure itself out? Law of averages. Like we talk about every single time that we do this, like, where is he actually sitting? You, you don't know. You don't know. It's like, I think there's a huge push from fans. Like, I'm included in that when I say that, like the Rockies are terrible right now. So like, what can we do to fire up the fountain, so to speak, and bring some life to this team? And Jordan Beck is that guy right now. But at what cost would that be? Like, I don't know. I, I keep going back and forth on my stance. Like, all right, just let the kids figure it out in the major league level. Let's see what we can do. But at the same time, confidence and being able to adjust on the fly. And I don't know. It's, it's a huge chess match that a lot of us aren't, we're not privy to, but wonder what they can do. Right. So I think it's just interesting. We, there you go. One more month. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I think it's interesting that the Rockies we're sitting here and we're, well, we have like four wins on the season and we're not, we got five. we're like afraid to get rid of guys, afraid to send guys down. Like, I feel like we should switch it up, bring someone that will bring the crowd back to cores and get everybody hyped up. Right, and the tennis is down, and you know, Mr. Dick doesn't like that. So we'll see how that plays out. Jordan Beck, definitely a call up. Just depends when. I think we all need to be patient. Let's let him have a few more ups and downs, so to speak, in AAA before we kind of jump on the Beck 
wagon there. Um, let's head to Double A Hartford, but this is going to be brought to you by Daily Controls, our fantastic sponsor. Uh, basically, Daily Controls LLC is that industrial automation controls engineering company that is excited to provide and apply its 13 plus years of experience in the industrial automation and robotics industry. Daily Controls services include PLC programming, HMI design, vision inspection systems, robotic integrations and programming, system integration, and troubleshooting and support. He does not have a button to write your final, though, Lewis, so you're going to have to do that on your own. Good luck with that. Data Controls is dedicated to reducing downtime, improving quality, and increasing that output. If your push buttons aren't blinking or your robots aren't cooperating, trust Data Controls to get your equipment running smoothly 24-7. Please email him at info at dailycontrolsllc.com just to say what's up. Hey, Blake Street Banter said to do this, so do it. That's all you need to do. Or check out his website, dailycontrolsllc.com. Hartford Yard Goats, the team I love to watch the most. They were being weird for me when I was trying to watch Jared Candy's outing. I just love to see that dude pitch. Wasn't able to do it because the MLB app was being super stupid. Uh, but the Goats, I don't – how did they end the week? I think – I don't know. I don't know if Mike can get on that record for us. Uh, but I mean, the talk of the town is Carson Palmquist, right? Another scoreless outing. I think he went six innings. That game was fantastic. That The game where he went with Veerling back and forth, Veerling went 100 pitches, seven innings of no hit ball against the Goats. And it wasn't like the Goats were not hitting it well. Like they were hitting it, they weren't hitting it. Like it was just fantastic pitching. By both sides, Carson Palmquist was going back and forth, 90 plus pitches, getting his 10, 12 strikeouts and just doing his thing. That was easily the best minor league baseball game I've ever seen. And the way it ended with the Jaden Hill walk off was kind of disheartening, but it was a good battle. The, the hitter Rice just found his pitch, fouled it off and got it over the fence, which was just a nod to Rice and not what Jaden Hill was doing. Uh, but any other big takeaways, Tyler, from Hartford other than Carson Palmquist? I mean, Coco, Zach Kakoska, our guy. Right. Two homers this week puts him up to a, a 1,098 OPS on the year. He He's comfortable. He looks comfortable. Um, that's a guy that a lot of people just haven't put as part of the future in any way, but he's playing himself into that, that first base – maybe some corner outfield talk like he's mm -hmm. going to go to triple a. We know that now he he's, I mean, a year ago, if you told me that Zach Acosta was going to be on the MLB radar, I, I would have been a little skeptical, but that guy, he's firmly on it right now. And, and I, I think that's a storyline so far that nobody was expecting, but everybody's happy to see a guy like him just raking in the minors. I mean, all he does is hit, right? Like that's all he did at Kansas State. <laughs> like, just let the guy have a stick. And he was he was smacking balls around in Spokane last year before he got on the injured list. Zach Kikoska and his development going forward. They I want to see him hit, hit more in the heart of the lineup. Because right now they have him seven, eight, nine. Haven't seen him in the three, four, five spot just yet. But everything about him and his power, like he's the one that broke up the no hitter the the other day. Like it wasn't against the starter, but it was he had a nice at bat, just crushed it the other way, lined it down the line, and had that double. Like I love seeing Kakaska do his thing as he's trying to learn first base because he didn't play first base until last year. It was awesome. So like the goats went three and three, right? Uh, Zach Kakaska, what were some of your takeaways there, Mike? I'm gonna go. Ryan Ritter finally showed something. His first couple of weeks have been kind of rough for him. He's been good in the field, but that's Ryan Ritter. We, we knew that was gonna happen. Uh, he's just been striking out too much, like he almost like twice a game. I think he had a golden sombrero game somewhere in there, but he had a couple two three hit games this week. Really, I think he got raised the OPS like seven five eight, which last week if you told me that that's an absolute win. It was like like five hundred. So shout out Ryan Ritter, he's back on the up upward trajectory. Need to see that. Yeah, that glove has got to play. Um... But then there is this there's this guy who do I want? Who was I thinking of this guy? Andrew Kazada. <laughs> I just like Coco. Maybe this is our <laughs> keep an eye on these guys. Andrew Kazada is a dog. He pitched the most innings uh, in any of the affiliates last year. 
he grinds out games. His stuff is not overpowering. He's crafty. He hasn't, he has everything that's like average, maybe slightly above average pitching, but he knows what to do with it. And he's making work of double A. It's insane, Tyler. Like, I love watching Andrew Cazada do his thing. Yeah. And he's down to a 129 ERA on the season. I, it's safe to say, like, he's not going to be some big time MLB player, but. For, for someone who's really grinded out a career, kind of an afterthought uh, in the early going, he's he's firmly on, you know, like Zach Yacosca, he's on the radar. Uh, whether that's going to be by, you know, necessity because they really need to get a start or because this guy's really earned it, it'll probably be somewhere in the middle. But for someone like Hizada, a seventh rounder in, in 2018. So if you're a 2018 draftee and you're, you know, fighting for a big league spot right now, like you are someone who's, who's really grinding and the grind's mm-hmm. paying off right now. He's super efficient. He is, he's missing more bats this year than he did in the past. Mm-hmm. And, and Isaac just coined in the chat, kind of like a Chi Chi Gonzalez, like someone you could rely on to, to pitch some innings and guys like that are valuable. We, we saw it last year. There were some guys who could not get outs. Uh, Andrew Kazada, I think with a little, you know, with, with some more time to continue building this momentum, he's a guy who could go and get outs at the highest level. So he, he definitely deserves some shout outs. Yeah. I, I would yeah, love to see, get some long relief action in there too. He, he was long relief. He filled in as long relief last year um, when the, some starters came up. So he has that ability too. Yeah, he's the guy that you were before. It's a common man. Like he's just grinding it out there for like seven years. Like if this guy makes his debut, like it's gonna be like just a heartwarming moment. He's gonna get. We saw Jackson Holiday get the call up, but like I mean, that was that was gonna happen. It's Jackson Holiday. Like when this guy gets the call up, he's gonna be crying because he worked eight years to get there. It's just it's fun to root for. Yeah, the dogs, so to speak, the grinders that are. <laughs> They're, they're just doing their thing. And then let's end it with Hartford. Evan Schauver. <laughs> Remember that guy? He was drafted, what, 21? Was he a top five, top six round pick? I think, Tyler, you probably know better. But 6.2 innings pitch, seven strikeouts. Continues just to do his thing. Only two walks, only two hits, zero on runs. That equates to a 0.60 whip for Evan Schauver. Thank you. He was a starter in college, right? Yeah, so he he uh, he came from Cincinnati, seventh rounder in twenty twenty one. He was someone that there in in the college ranks, not an overpowering guy, but really good metrics on his fastball, uh, a good breaking ball, good changeup, and clearly starting in the pros wasn't ideal. He he had some struggles there, but someone that written all over him like worst case this guy could could come in in relief, and now that he's in that role full time, Evan Shaver. You know, left-handed always gets you a little bit more of a look. He's doing a, a fantastic job in in the pure relief role. This is, you know, someone who could also go and, and get you multiple innings. So Evan Traver finding a home, we we love to see it. Yes, yes, we do. And I think that's all that we need to talk. Alec Barger has also done well in his 3.2 innings pitch. Five strikeouts, not no runs allowed in that time. Just his – just – I don't know the arm barn in Hartford. Like it's the goat barn. <laughs> we should just call it the goat barn out there in Duncan Park. Um, and so maybe that leads into our transition to Spokane. And what do we do with the big three? So you have Chase Dollander, you have Sean, um, Sean Sullivan, and then you have Carson Palmquist. I'm going to throw this idea out here. And then Lewis, you tell me if I'm an idiot and then you probably disagree with me because you're also an idiot. So we can just do that together. <laughs> but why not? Why don't the Rockies put these three together in the same rotation right now and just grow them all together? So we have a three headed monster in 2025, 2026 of just studs. Carson Palmquist is getting strikeouts now in double A. He's three starts in four starts in. He looks everything that he's supposed to be call up triple a whatever sean sullivan came down to earth last this last outing but that was bound to happen sooner or later spokane will do that to you but and then there's there's chase just doing chase things right why not bring all three of these up they all have a future as a starter they're all dogs right now why not just bring them all up together and just like all right let's just revamp these colorado rockies rotation I mean, only thing I can think of is like it would be an incredible competitive imbalance for 
whatever whatever Eastern League, if that's next year, PCL or MLB even. Like these three together will be like one, two, three. You're getting two runs in what eighteen innings for three days straight. Like have fun. Uh, right. like, it would be fun to see these guys develop together. Really, com- I want to see them compared with each other. I know Pom- Palmquist is Double A, so it's tough to compare between Double A and Spokane, which kind of sucks for us who loves the nerds about it, like to rate players. But it's tough to rate them when they're all not letting any anything by them. So there's that. Dan, I want to see with with Chase Dolander. It, it, it's so nitpicky, but I I just want to <laughs> see him dominate in in every way because he's dominating in basically every way. But with Dolander, he's given up two homers now. It's two homers in four starts. It's not bad. But it seems that most of the base runners he is allowing on, the guys to get on base, a lot of them are scoring. I, I want to see him clean the the real details up of his pitching because this this week he, he struck out 12 guys and five and a third. But four, all four, uh, he, he let up five base runners. Four of them scored. It, it's this trend with him that he's he's been amazing. There's a little cleanup to be done. And so that's where I'm like, Make a couple more starts in high A where he he can get to that dominant level. Hartford might give him a little bit more of a challenge. I just want to see dominance because that's something that could it could start to carry over a little bit more if he is just truly working on all cylinders. That's fair. Uh, the dominant piece is a good point. I like that. And also to Chase's point, he had a runner. Okay, so crazy play in Spokane. Get, let's uh, let's take first guy on right, and then the next guy he crushes one to right center. He hit it well to right center, hits the right fielder in the glove, but it drops out of it. Should have been an error. Was originally ruled an error, and then was turned into a hit. He never touched first base, um, and then the it run ended up counting as an earned run. So take one of those off because that was a BS scorebook thing, but. I think I agree with your just dominance. Like, how how are you going to dominate? Where are you dominating? And just do it all a part of it. Like, we kind of saw that with Joe Rock a few years ago. Like, when he was he was good in Spokane, but he was allowing runners to come all the way around. He wasn't good with runners on in on base. He came back last year and dominated in that in that world. So, to that point, I I, I agree with that. Um, let Hale be the closer. Let's do it, Darnells. I'm not. I'm not stepping off of that 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 hill there. So <laughs> uh it would be and then South Halverson, he's he's going through his bumps and bruises right now. He's he's a little erratic with his 100 plus there, but he's gonna figure it out. Um, this was a question on Instagram, so this might be more for Mike than Tyler. I don't think Tyler, you collect cards very much, but if you were to buy a first Bowman of a Rockies player, not in the top 100, who would it be? Basically, whose stock is high? Not in the I'll top. I'll go Andy them. Perez. <laughs> nice. I'll go Andy, definitely Andy. Perez. I think you got to go with those lower guys, the single A, the single A, even like DCL guys, ACL guys, because they're not really known yet. But Andy Perez will be known by the end of the year. I can promise you that. We'll talk about him later. <laughs> You're going to be the best one to do that. Do you have? Do you that's have not stock that? advice, though. <laughs> <That's> not- <laughs> This is not financial advice. Not, not an investment <laughs> piece. This is just for fun piece. I would I would say get some Dion Jorge stock. Yeah. Another yeah. one that we'll, we'll talk about here shortly. Uh, Dion Zach Jorge Veen, is yeah. a madman. But, yeah, Zach Veen, technically not a top 100 guy. It, it, he's a buy low. Like, it's a stock that was once high. You have a chance to capitalize at its, at its 52-week low. Now is the time. <laughs> <laughs> now is the time. I – yeah, I mean, we have him rated pretty high on ours, so like we kind of forget, like in the BSB world, that he's not top 100. But Zach Veen is a good call. You know what? I'm going. I'm going. Friend of the pod, family of the pod, Zach Kakoska. Buy, find a Zach Kakoska Bowman, and if you can, buy two of them and send me one, please. That would be sweet. All right, <laughs> let's go to, over to Spokane. We actually haven't talked about Spokane themselves. I think they went what four and two. They're still doing well. Um, Big takeaways, the Dolander, Sullivan, right? Victor Juarez doing his thing. He is not dominant in those, but it's very Jared Candy-like. The other, His outing, he went five or six innings, two hits. Uh, four hits, two runs. Both happen to be off solo shots. So he's giving up the long ball, but they're not doing terrible damage. 
Um, and Zach Agnos <laughs> just yet to allow a run in five appearances. I think that was a big question mark for me was, all right, can Zach Agnos be a dominant in the next part? Because he was fantastic at Fresno as he was learning how to pitch, right? And here he is doing it in Spokane. And does I, I think everything is said, he can keep this up, right? Yeah, I mean, I think he's the future closer of through the minor leagues, at least. And the Rockies clearly want to get this guy all the experience he can in those high leverage roles. Um, but like he he's showing like zero signs of of wavering off this pace. It's kind of crazy. It's getting to crazy levels. Well, we saw what he did last year, and he's just continuing it. Um, you know, to to close games in every opportunity. It's very impressive. That speaks beyond like anything that you can measure with your with your eyes, um, or you know, looking at the pitch metrics. The suit is going out and, and closing at every opportunity he's given, and he's being thrown into those high leverage situations. Like he's coming in in the extra innings. Like Tolkien has like three or four extra innings already. I think Zach has been in three of them. So high leverage situations for Agnos. I think the Rockies are thinking highly of him. Who's who's a bat that kind of stood out to you there, Mike? Who's who's the big dog up in the Northwest? <laughs> Cole Carrick, and uh, partly because not because of his bat, because he played shortstop for the last game of the series, which is like, what can't that guy do? But Carrick, I think we know what Carrick is. Like he's this. I guess we know that he's this oddball of a player type, and that like he's just the type of guy you can kind of plug anywhere. And I think his bat it's starting to come on. And if he can get that bat turned around, he can play any position. He's like the ultimate dude that you want, like as like a bench bat. Like here, someone's sick. Let's throw him here at outfield, second base, catcher, like kind of anything. So big week for him. Right, he's he's struggling to find the bat, but he still has an eight fifty OPS, which is quite insane. He, I think he had a good week, right? Like, do you know his stats off the top yeah. of your head? Like, I I know Cole Caracar, <laughs> like that be. Be pretty solid. Like he's kind of like Greg Jones, but with more upside. It kind of feels like. <laughs> Anything, Tyler? Kyle Karos. I mean, if if I'm turning to to another dude, Kyle Karos is just looking sharp as a as a pure hitter. He has more walks than strikeouts, and this is a guy who's been. Cha- I mean, he's he's still 21, which is pretty young for a guy who was drafted last summer. He's not going to turn 22 until the draft is passed so th- this is a this is a younger dude he has 12 walks to 11 strikeouts on the season he hasn't found that true power stroke yet but kyle Karos is showing why the rockies picked him in the fifth round it is a the the pedigree we know that we know about the pedigree eric Karos's son it's translating it to, for him as a hitter um, and he's 6'5 220 you know he's gonna at, at some point he's gonna hit some some more homers so Kyle Karros has, has absolutely blown up his stock to start this season. Um, you know, he he and Cole Carrick from last year's draft really, really carrying the freight and just have to throw some love to Dion Jorge because I mentioned him. He walked seven times this week and just struck out twice, mm-hmm. up to 11 walks and nine strikeouts on the season. He's, he's as pure of a hitter as they come. He hasn't gotten yard yet, but that dude is going to get on base every level that he plays at. And he, what he's twenty one, right? Did we decide on that? I'm. He might be twenty. 20 still. I'm. He he's one of those tweeners because he, he played. He got into the pros a little bit late, and yeah, he is twenty one. He turned twenty one in March. Yeah. Okay. But still so a, cat, a young cat. Yeah, it, just insane, right? So, I wanted to give some love to the arm barn up there. I think there was some guy who was. Of course, my thing's not doing the thing it needs to do. Uh, not going to waste it. All right, let's go down to Fresno. Don't know. <laughs> I'll try to figure it out. Maybe when one of you guys are doing your thing. Fresno, the Cali League, they're still first place. I think they've only lost like maybe four times on the young season. I mean, just go off, King. Tell me a little bit more about Andy Perez, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Andy Perez is my age, which makes me feel so like I said this last week. Like I'm over here talking about Andy Perez, and he's my age doing crazy things. But once again, the glove in the field is great, which 
is a great baseline for any player. So like you got to start there. Like, hey, your glove is great. You're gonna play. I mean, he had another great week. Like, 1.065 OPS, which isn't even best on the team. Spoiler alert. But he, he's hitting bombs. I think he had a grand slam this week. I mean, mm-hmm. I think he had a grand slam. I think he had another double with the bases loaded, like the day after. So he had a, racked up a bunch of RBIs. He's, I think he's like, I think so far the biggest riser in terms of prospects we have in the system. Yeah, he he's definitely up there. We. Knew last year, everyone was kind of high on him. The Fresno dudes were high on him last year, but he was 18 playing in Fresno. Coming back second second go around, that talent can really, really shine through. So I, th- I think that take of highest prospect riser in the system, it's, it's still early, but he looks like a surefire top 30 prospect at this point. Which is insane because he was like, no nothing like no, nothing against him like he struggled mightily last year in fresno first year first professional season all all across the board but and then just what he's doing so far is like all right last year wasn't even me this is me and just like coming out of the gates on fire it was a, it's it's fun to watch and then he's doing that like at second base because braylon wimmer is He's Andy's doing third and second. He's kind of split in between the two because Brandon Wimmer, <laughs> who's a dog, is doing his thing at shortstop. I mean, Wimmer has a one zero three five OPS on the season, four home runs, pair of jacks this week. Just like they are literally playing that old school commercial between the the soccer people. Anything you can do, I can do better. Forget who they were. It was Michael Jordan and the. <laughs> the female soccer player thing. Um, so like <laughs> they really are watching the Rockies game while this happens. Uh, so they really are just kind of doing their own commercial thing. So Steven, Johnny, if you're listening, can you just kind of reenact that with Andy and Braylon for us and just say, we, we gave you that idea. It's just, it's the middle infielder. Like I think Tyler, you're the one that kind of put me on that. Like you want as many infield middle infielders as you possibly can, because they can do, whatever you want, anywhere you want. And they Rockies have that in Brilliant Wimmer and Andy Perez right now. And it's like, it's fun to actually watch the Fresno's Grizzlies late. Yeah. I mean, Braylon Wimmer's a dog. We've, <laughs> we've been, we've been on that. I've, I like, I wish I had more time to look up our, our tweets when they drafted him. That dude is a dog has been from day one. He's going to be like the, the one kind of, Thing in the in the way of Andy Press being the biggest prospect riser is Braylon Wimmer, because he was a, a relatively high draft pick last year and is just killing it in Fresno. He I I, I don't know who it was that that kind of comped him to Ryan Ritter in terms of this dude plays shortstop straight out of college can come in and and rake and work his way up. You know he's not Ryan Ritter in terms of our, the the player archetype, but there's a lot of similarities and and in terms of rising through the system. I think that that's Braylon Wimmer. Yeah, I said that. Um, <laughs> but I think you're right. Aiden Longwell has been doing his thing too on base machine. Like he's on base every time I'm reading the box score every single morning for the minor Rocky Colorado Rockies minor league daily recap that you can find on the YouTube channel every single morning. Quick seven minutes. Yes, shameless plug. I am saying saying Aiden Longwell's name usually wrong. I don't know why I mess up his first name every single time, but he's. His OBP, OBP, not OPS, OBP is at four 400 on this season. So just insane things. And then there are two pitching performances we need to talk about. Go Big Red, Jace Kaminska, and Jack Jack Mahoney. One of you take one of them and just go <laughs> off. Like, just insane stuff by both of them. I mean, it's, it's cool. What, yeah, to steal your thunder – Jace Kaminska, like, go Big Red. This dude is, I wouldn't say coming out of nowhere, but this is a guy without much hype who has been, he's, I mean, he's not part of the big three, but he's kind of like, you guys aren't going to leave me behind in terms of performance. He's down to a a .071 ERA this season. I'm getting, I'm getting big Blake Adams vibes from last year where Blake Adams was incredible in Fresno. Had some struggles in in Spokane, but now Blake Adams is doing very well up there. Jace Kaminska, like he, oh my gosh, twelve Ks this week, and 
Uh, I, I think it was like seven and a third, if I'm not mistaken. Like, quick work, got the 12 Ks. No one is getting on base against him. He's not letting runs up. It's another big riser. Yeah, eight eight Ks in four innings pitch this week. Yeah, and then the 16th, he had four strikeouts and 3.2. He throws a lot of pitches, but a lot of them are strikes, which is really weird. I don't know. Maybe you can enlighten me on this. So he had 70-ish pitches in those four innings, but like 55 of them were strikes. So like what's happening? Because he's not allowing hits. He had uh, he is allowed it. No, two hits. He had two hits allowed in that, and he walked one. Like that's a lot of pitches in four innings, right? Yeah, but yeah, I, I think if you can avoid the the damage zone, you know, it's it's okay if you're not ultra efficient. Because yeah, seven and seven and two thirds is what he got through two starts. You want more than that. You absolutely want more than that. You want more strikes. Uh, but he's he's the furthest thing from Blake Snell. But Blake Snell shows like you might not live in the zone always, but if you can avoid the real damage. That's that's really the key at this point to pitching. Um, find find a way to just to li- limit the damage, and he's not walking anybody, so he he's sticking around and counts, and he's throwing competitive pitches late and counts. He he can get by with that, uh, but, but he, he, he is he throwing strikes, Tyler. Little. He is throwing strikes, Tyler. But you know he could he could ramp that efficiency up to to really get it down. Okay, okay, and then Jack Mahoney. Player of the week. We didn't even talk about the player of the week in the Northeast League, Braden Ward. I don't know how we missed our our dog there. Triples, doubles, OPS of like nine hundred up in Spokane. Braden, I apologize, friend of the pod. Like we should have we should have been better on that. I blame Mike. But then there is Jack Mahoney, who I've been saying we need to talk more about, and he's given us a reason to talk more about him. Like, is he actually this good, Mike? Like, is this actually who Jack Mahoney is supposed to be? I, I do think because I think Mahoney is kind of like in the shadow. The way the pitching lines up, he's always with like a Dolander start. So like we're all looking at Dolander mm-hmm. and Mahoney's there with just another solid outing. I think it's like a sub three ERA so far. Yeah, so, sub two ERA, 1.65. He's not a strikeout machine. Um, he's, I almost want to say Logan Webbish, where it's like he's not like, well, one strikeout in inning, but also single A. So. But, like, I mean, he's, he's going to let up hits. He's just going to make sure he doesn't let up runs, though. That's the thing with Mahoney. And he's a college arm, so you don't really have to worry about him. You see these guys that are, like, 18, and you just have to Andy Perez, giving up a bunch of runs early. This guy's already been through the SEC baseball. Like, he knows what it's about. I think he could rise up to Spokane in a couple weeks. Yeah, I mean, when do we see these call-ups? I, I know, remember we talked about this last year was when these guys started hot out of the gate. Like you got Mahoney and Kaminsky, and then you got Dollander and Sullivan. You have what, who? Palm Quest and I mean Palm Quest right now is the starter. Kazeda, right? He can move up. Like when are we seeing these guys move up? I, we kind of talked about with Jordan Beck. Like at, at what's the name, right? Like what's the time frame? But like. I feel like it's a little bit different with minor leaguers. Are we just waiting for dominance, complete dominance, Tyler, before they're they're moving up? I'm. I think a big consideration is going to be injuries at the at the the upper levels, like just that domino effect of you, you might have a guy go out for an organic reason instead of making a spot for him above, and you know one promotion is going to lead to the next. Uh, I mean, there's dudes stashed on the IL and the developmental list, but. One promotion uh, that, that might be the, the effect of an injury is going to lead to the next guy also. And, um, you know, someone like Jack, Jack Mahoney could get it without an injury, and he's, he's worthy of that. He's a third-round pick last season. You know, the Rockies have shown with high picks they're not afraid to push those guys to higher levels. But I, I think it, at this point it's going to take an injury. There are good teams, you know, double-A through, through single-A, and – it's hard to mess with with those units, uh, but an injury might be, you know, the, the silver lining would be some push. I'm I'm gonna say mid May, just just for a callback reason earlier. I just there might be something there. I don't know. I, I think that's kind of when they started calling up people last year. It was like mid May, early June is when kind of the push. Like Gabe Hughes was in Akron, early June, mid June. That's when he got his call up. So. 
probably about another month or so injury. Cause I mean, like when is Hughes coming back? Do we know? If at all, probably probably July or August. Yeah. I don't know what they're going to do with Hughes Cox. um, Who's the other guy? Vargas. It's like a Jordy. And they're all throwing. I saw Vargas is throwing, but it's probably about a year, usually a year out. But are they going to rush him? Are they going to do? I don't know. So we'll see about that. I'm going to say, yeah, mid May, mid mid to late June. Um, Yankee got called up in June. Yeah, May, not June. So yeah, like the the May push, right, was the call up. And yeah, if you're going to watch the the isotopes, Walker Bueller started on Wednesday against that. It'll be a fun little <laughs> test for our guys, Coco, Stunky, yeah. across the board. Grant Levine's probably going to take him yards, so just, just <laughs> watch for that. Walker, watch yourself. Uh, it'll be fun though. Um, do which one do you want to talk about? So, which one of these topics do we want to end on? You guys can vote. The weird call up in the middle of the week where Noah Davis came up and then went back down or Zach Veen and kind of the, the re hype, but is it real hype? So to speak, what do you guys want to talk about to in the, in the pod here? Um, Zach, Zach Veen. Zach Veen. Yeah. All right. You both yeah. said at the same time. All right. Zach Veen. So some of the call up, right? We freely went to the IL and we were, we knew something was, or it was it was far going to the IL. So we knew something was happening. Right. I'm like, all right, how, how is this going to work? And people on Twitter were saying Zach Veen question mark after Zach Veen hadn't played you know, three out of the six games all this week because of some injury. Still don't know what that was. Right. But how much stock are we putting into this healthy Veen and his performance right now? There's some knocks like you, I need to see more more power. But his strikeouts a little bit right, a little high, but he's still performing. He's still producing. He's still doing his thing. So I guess what is your overall take on Zach Veen in twenty twenty four, Tyler? So far, so to speak. Like, it's I know we we saw Luke on Twitter kind of tooting his horn. He had, he had a great <laughs> take on our pod last year, where last year with the wrist injury not swinging for power. He found himself as a hitter and that is fully translated. So I'm, I'm excited by the fact that there's the strikeouts are a little bit high, but he's making a lot of good contact. And that's something we hadn't seen at two tries, two abbreviated tries at the double a level, but he's getting a lot of good contact out there now. And I'm confident in his aptitude as a hitter to eventually lower those K's get into a few more pitches to, to, you know, take him yard the, the big keys really are, can he make a lot of good contact, get a lot of extra base hits, and that's exactly what he's doing so far. I would love to see him in AAA, but willing to be a little patient with him. Mike? I agree. Uh, Veen's probably my favorite prospect, so seeing this kind of warms my heart. Number one high school player from like the perfect game rate and that uh, out of high school, so – he has the talent, and for the last two years, it's been like almost like painful to watch this guy just get injured and try to play through that wrist thing. And then now his numbers look really bad. And now when you go to the MLB pipeline, he's not there because of that. It's just like all of this kind of commenced, and now we're here, and he's killing it. Thousand OPS. Yeah, you see the speed shine. He's really being out a lot of infield singles. He had two, I think, against Bowie that they caught out. He was thousand percent safe, but whatever. <laughs> and I mean, we see all the time with these guys where, like. We, fan drafts did point out something apparently you can't hit a fastball i don't know what they say it might be because of the wrist mm-hmm. thing we don't have numbers in hartford so we don't really know we might have to get uh in contact with the hartford guys so we can get any inside insider information <laughs> but uh i think he'll be fine i think i think he'll adapt him and i would love to see him in the pcl i think he would rake in the pcl he'd be like greg jones with power like more power in contact more power right I yeah, I just, that fan graph thing was interesting because I can't say I've ever really realized that or noticed it, but it would kind of make sense if he's still trying to catch up to the fastball after his time off. Uh, the strikeout rate he has 12 strikeouts and 43 plate appearances, so we're sitting around 25%, which isn't terrible. The walk rate five walks in 43, uh, so what's that like about seven percent, maybe six, seven percent there. And the OPS is at above one, right? 1.050. So in the 
43 plate appearances. Again, only 11 games because of those injuries. He's still doing sack fiend things that, that we all loved. But I guess kind of keeping out like what pitches is he throwing? Like we all see that Monty has trouble with the curve, right? So is Zach Veen going to have trouble with the, the fastball, the high heat and that kind of stuff might be something we kind of see how he develops. And I'm sure he knows that if it, that is a thing and he's going to be working on it, but whoo! do you all see that? No. <laughs> oh, that was sweet. B rod gold glove winner. Sorry if I hurt your ears there. Diving catch, top of the eighth, diving play, up the middle, glove flips it to Tovar, double play, he's out. That was awesome. Can, can we steal a little thunder from Noah and James real quick and just point out how the Rockies pitching staff is, like, doing okay in the lineup, has, like, yeah. one run, like, on average per yeah. game at Coors Field? If the pitching is good, the lineup that. doesn't do anything. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A complete game. Yeah, have both. Like, yeah. but I've read a yeah. million tweets this offseason about how they have no pitching, and it's not a great pitching staff, but you know, that, that offense is is having a bit of a go. A bit of a go. Yeah, yeah when teams score against us, they score a lot. Yeah. Oh <laughs> <laughs> Road to Blake, or this is no longer Road to Blake Street. Thanks. <laughs> no, <laughs> thanks for sticking on the road. What problem would you rather have with prospect? Not hit a fastball or not hit a curve or breaking? I, w- I think curve. It's tough. I like, I it's feel like the, the fastball is just the, the fastball is such an innate thing for so not many Chris. guys to hit that you you would think you would probably want to develop the ability to hit breaking balls. But if, like, you could have a prospect that – like, would you rather – could you fix Montero or Veen? Which one – like, if you were a coach, like, or, <laughs> hypothetically. Me which one's easier? personally. Like, if I'm thinking of me and my abilities, which one could I <laughs> fix easier? I think I could learn to hit the fastball – I think I could learn to hit the fastball quicker than I could learn how to hit the curve. Okay. I think that too. It's just, so it's it odd be... to see the, the inverse though. Usually like so many guys are like Montero. Barely like, anyone is struggling something... to hit. I feel like that's something like... to catch out of the draft. Like, oh, this guy can't hit over 92. <laughs> but, but I think it's something you can learn. Yeah. Like you can so. see enough 95s and adjust and – do damage but like a curveball it's it's moving completely different rates completely different ways but like a, i don't know i just think at 95 per hour fastball <laughs> it's turning to a watch along <laughs> yeah pretty I mean, much for, for someone like veen he probably didn't see any velo like that until uh you know maybe a little bit on on showcase events but the pros was probably the first time he's consistently seeing even like you know, consistent low mid nineties. He probably saw nineties a little bit in high school, like ninety ninety one. But oh my god, being ninety three, it was probably a little bit of a of an adjustment. Camp Campusano was safe by a total of three inches at second base and home plate on that run. He should have. He almost yeah. got gunned out by Nolan Jones at on his double, and then he almost got gunned out by Bouchard at home. But do we literally. have one hit? Yeah, one hit. Yeah, the Rockies <laughs> let Dylan Cease go seven plus innings. I'm telling you, if we get a good pitching performance pitches. like we did today, it doesn't bad. It just don't comes back around. Dylan Cease should not be able to ever go seven innings or eighty pitches. But this is a podcast, so we need to stop. All right. Uh, <laughs> anything else for the good of the cause? Huge shout out to Noah Davis. It looked really good in his three innings yesterday. It had some weak contact that allowed some hits there, but good to see him back. It doesn't look like his injury is a big deal. He was posting some stuff and he's still contacting and talking and all that. So it doesn't look like he's like MIA dark 30 thing. So I'm sure he's all right. <laughs> Go Rocks, minor league affiliates. Woo! Thank you for watching and listening. Please check out our link tree for more content.